Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to Steptoe's annual, uh, second annual regulatory symposium. Uh, my name is Peter Denton. I'm a partner in our transportation and infrastructure practice groups here at Steptoe. Uh, this is the third of four programs uh, in the symposium. Today, we are focused on mergers and acquisitions in regulated industries. Uh, you can find links to the recordings from our first two programs on our website, along with a link to register for our fourth program that's upcoming. Uh, so as our final participants are logging in, I wanted to run through a few technical details. Uh, for the duration of the program, all participants will be in listen-only mode. Uh, as you have questions, we encourage you to submit them via the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if we run out of time and cannot get to all of our questions, we can follow up with you separately. The program is also being recorded and a link will be shared with everyone uh, who is registered following our program. Okay, so today our panel of uh, step two attorneys and clients will discuss mergers and acquisitions in regulated industries where federal agencies other than the traditional antitrust authorities, uh, DOJ and FTC, have overlapping or exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, we'll discuss our panelists' experience in these transactions, uh, including how regulatory agencies interact with the antitrust authorities, uh, trends in regulatory risk mitigation, CFIUS review of foreign investment, and third-party participation in the transaction review to seek competitive remedies. I'll start by briefly introducing our panelists, then Damon and Brian will provide short presentations, and then we'll open it up to a conversation amongst the full panel. So Damon Kalt uh, is a partner in Steptoe's antitrust practice. Uh, Damon's practice encompasses all aspects of antitrust law, including mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, and Hart Scott Rodino compliance. Damon has experience working as a trial attorney in the DOJ's antitrust division, along with working in house at Cigna Corporation as senior counsel for antitrust and competition. Brian Egan is a partner in Steptoe's economic sanctions, export controls, and national security CFIUS uh, practice. Uh, Brian is a former senior legal official with the White House, the National Security Council, and the Department of State and Department of Treasury under the Obama administration. Greg Kamet is the Associate General Counsel, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Affairs for Entergy Services, LLC. Greg leads a team of attorneys that represent Entergy and its affiliates before the Feder Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC and the Department of Justice. Greg has been with Entergy for 17 years. Uh, prior to that time, he was an associate with Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in the firm's FERC regulatory practice. Greg has represented the energy operating companies and Energy's unregulated business in more than a dozen ac asset acquisitions reviewed by FERC and DOJ. Uh, Fred Day is a senior vice president within the Brookfield Infrastructure Group where he primarily focuses on deal execution, financings, portfolio management, and other related matters. Prior to joining Brookfield, uh, Fred practiced law at Skadden Arts, where he focused on mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance, and private equity transactions. Uh, and finally, Hadas Kogan uh, serves as Director and Senior Counsel Regulatory Affairs for DISH, uh, she's responsible for advancing DISH's position on a variety of telecommunications issues before federal agencies, and she's been with the company since 2012. Okay, so now I would like to uh, turn things over to Damon Colt and Brian Egan, my partners, to make a couple of brief presentations. I uh, will start with, with you, Damon. Great, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks for our panelists uh, for joining us today. <clears throat> As P Peter mentioned, I wanted to start off by providing some kind of general background uh, regarding the regulatory landscape that mergers and acquisitions face in regulated industries. <clears throat> in particular, um, as Peter mentioned, there's obviously merger review authority by the antitrust authorities. Uh, but in addition, uh, they, there may be uh, regulatory review authority for mergers uh, by uh, industry regula regulators themselves uh, in their respective industry. Uh, so hopefully this will lay a bit of a foundation uh, for our discussion today uh, that we'll have uh, with our with our panelists. Um, so first, with respect to uh, antitrust review, um, as you know, the antitrust division of the DOJ and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, 
uh, have authority to review mergers and acquisitions. Uh, there's a long history of, of merger review here in the US. I won't go through all of that, but thought I'd touch on a, a few highlights. Um, so the uh, merger regulatory uh, regime uh, here in the US uh, from an antitrust and competition standpoint has evolved against a backdrop of, of three distinct statutes. First is the Sherman Act of 1890. Uh, second, the Clayton Act, which was originally enacted in 1914 and subsequently amended. Uh, and finally, the Hart Scott Rodino Antitrust Improvement Acts uh, of 1976. So briefly on, on those uh, three statutes that provide the framework for antitrust review here in the United States, uh, the Sherman Act um, has, has two principal sections. Section one uh, prohibits unreasonable agreements and restraint of trade, while section two prohibits the anti-competitive acquisition or maintenance of monopoly power. Um, I started here because for the first uh, quarter century after its enactment, the Sherman Act well, was the federal government's only tool for challenging anti-competitive mergers. Um, but for the most part, it had little, the government had little success in bringing such challenges. Thus, against that backdrop, uh, Congress enacted the Clayton Act in 1914, um, which it went on to amend uh, later in 1950 to close a number of loopholes. Uh, the Clayton Act today, uh, Section 7 of the Clayton Act, uh, generally prohibits corporate acquisitions whose effect may be substantially to lessen competition or to tend to create a monopoly. Um, as the Supreme Court explained in Brown's shoe, this provision uh, was intended to reach incipient monopolies and trade restraints outside of the scope of the Sherman Act. Um, again, today, this is the primary statute under which mergers are challenged by the antitrust agencies. Um, however, because there was no pre-merger review process um, after the enactment of the Clayton Act, companies had the incentive to quickly close their transactions integrate as fast as possible, which then left the antitrust agencies with the problem that became that came to be known as how do you unscramble the eggs if they want to challenge a merger. So to address this in 1976, Congress enacted the HSR Act, which established a pre-notification re regime to give the antitrust agencies the ability to review and challenge transactions prior to consummation. Uh, the HSR Act is a a long, a long act and process and review process. I'll just kind of touch on some of the highlights. Uh, it requires parties uh, to transactions meeting certain size thresholds to give advance notice of their intention to merge. Uh, there's a regime of notification report form, the HSR form as it's known as, with accompanying documents and information about the transactions. That filing triggers a, a 30 day waiting period for, for most transactions, there are some exceptions. Uh, during that, that time frame, that 30 days, the DOJ or the FTC uh, will reach out on a voluntary basis to the merging parties, customers, competitors, to try to get a sense of the transaction's likely competitive effects. Um, after that 30 days, uh, the reviewing agency must decide if they want to clear the transaction or, or issue a what's called a second request. A second request is going to extend the review period um, automatically until the parties substantially comply with the second request, which entails responding to those document and data and information um, requests. Upon completion of that review, uh, the, and the agency, whether it be the FTC or DOJ, then makes a decision if they want to let the transaction go through, uh, challenge it, or as often may be the case uh, for transactions for which they have competitive concerns, enter into some sort of, sort of settlement. Uh, one thing to note, the FTC has its own administrative process, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit further, in many respects is similar to the process at FERC and the FTC, FCC, um, whereby they can go to their administrative process, but in order to halt a transaction uh, through a preliminary injunction, they must go to uh, federal court. So that's the backdrop with respect to anti the antitrust review of the agencies. I'm gonna touch briefly on uh, the other regulatory bodies. Uh, which our panelists uh, will, will talk more about and we'll get into some of the differences. Um, so historically, in, in certain regulated industries, uh, agencies themselves uh, have had the ability to review uh, mergers within their jurisdictions. Today, however, uh, there are only four industries left in which a regulatory agency has merger review authority. These include banking, which is regulated by, by a whole 
a host of uh, federal banking statutes and agencies, uh, electric power regulated by FERC, telecommunications and media uh, regulated by the FCC, and railroads uh, regulated by the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, of note, there, as I mentioned, there were other agencies that uh, had such jurisdiction, uh, and they included trucking and airlines and natural gas and some others, uh, but they, uh, such uh, authority uh, has now passed and such uh, competition review is done by the FTC and DOJ. Um, so just a, a brief little kind of snapshot on, on the review authority of these regulatory agencies and how that uh, is similar and different, differs from uh, the FTC and, and DOJ review. Uh, so first, uh, in, in telecommunications and in electric power, uh, the DOJ has, as I mentioned, full authority to review a merger under the Clayton Act, regardless of the FCC's or FERC's authority uh, to consider implications of the merger with their respective uh, missions. Uh, in these two industries, however, FERC and the FT FCC do consider competition as part of their broader review under the public interest standard. Uh, the FCC, for example, will, will uh, investigate things such as, in addition to competition, diversity of views, universal service goals, uh, among others, all under the public interest standard. Similarly, uh, FERC has its own public interest standard, in addition to competition, will consider, among other things, um, safety, services, uh, service availability, rates, uh, uh, in determining whether or not a particular transaction satisfies the public interest. Uh, finally, uh, it, there's railroads uh, where uh, Congress in 1955 abolished uh, the Interstate Com Commerce Commission and transferred uh, the ICC's historical merger review authority to the STB. Uh, the STB similarly reviews mergers under a public interest standard, uh, which incorporates a number of things, including safety, costs, uh, as well as whether there will be an adverse impact on competition. Um, the STB, unlike uh, telecommunications and electric power, has exclusive jurisdiction over rail carrier mergers. Uh, therefore, rail mergers approved by the STB are exempt from the antitrust laws, including uh, the HSR Act. And finally, um, in addition to these, this myriad of regulatory agencies uh, with merger review authority, the states, uh, including state attorney generals, public utility commissions, other industry re regulators, um, also for their respective jurisdictions and states can have merger review authority. Um, so hopefully that provides a bit of background and context for our panel today uh, from an antitrust and competition perspective. Um, now I believe Brian is gonna discuss CFIUS issues uh, that are, uh, may arise in regulated industry transactions. Great, thanks so much, Damon. Uh, and thanks to everybody for being with us today. Uh, CFIUS, some think of CFIUS as the, the five letter US government committee that is shrouded in mystery. Fortune Magazine recently ran a story calling CFIUS, quote, the secret government committee that could kneecap a foreign investor. Um, I think CFIUS can be a bit of a black box. I'm hoping to provide some basics on the process and how it interacts with regulated industries uh, to help address some, some questions. So first, CFIUS is an interagency U.S. government committee. It's not a single agency. It's chaired by the Treasury Department, uh, but all of the major U.S. government national security and trade agencies from the State Department to DOD, to DOJ, Commerce, USTR, DHS, et cetera, all of them participate in the CFIUS process. Uh, and CFIUS's mission is to conduct a national security review of foreign investments in U.S. companies. So all industries are fair game for CFIUS if CFIUS finds there's a national security interest in a transaction. CFIUS identifies national security interests based either on a threat that is posed by the foreign acquirer in the eyes of the US government or a vulnerability in the US target company uh, from a national security perspective. And CFIUS has the authority when it identifies a national security threat uh, to require changes to a transaction to mitigate the threat or in the most extreme cases, it can prohibit or re recommend that the president prohibit a transaction uh, from moving forward. For many years, CFIUS has been a voluntary process. Some people say the word voluntary in air quotes because uh, 
the consequences of failing to file with CFIUS uh, when the government has a national security concern can be significant. CFIUS can actually review deals months or even years after they close if they have a concern and they can require changes to a deal, they can require the parties in some cases to unwind the transaction. Uh, some of you following the news on TikTok recently and who's gonna buy TikTok and is it Microsoft, is it Oracle, what's Walmart doing? That's all driven by a CFIUS review and a recommendation of the president to unwind a transaction that took place in 2017. So CFIUS can have a dramatic impact on transactions. Uh, the, the voluntary nature of CFIUS review has changed recently. Uh, under a, a new law passed in 2018, filings with CFIUS are mandatory with respect to a few relatively narrow categories of transactions. But it's important on the front end to identify whether a filing is mandatory because a failure to file uh, when the requirement is there can lead to monetary penalties. I just wanna highlight three points from the CFIUS process that I thought may be of particular interest to you uh, who work in regulated industries. So the first is that the CFIUS review typically is concurrent with any of the other required federal government reviews or notification procedures. So for example, Damon mentioned that uh, the FCC and the Surface Transportation Board have their own public interest review processes. CFIUS's review typically runs at the same time as those processes. Or if you deal with classified US government contracts, the DOD review runs at the same time as the CFIUS process. Um, and in some cases, the other federal regulator will make its, its approval contingent on the parties also receiving CFIUS approval. So the two could be linked in some ways, even though the review processes are completely independent. And that kind of brings me to my second point, which is that the process of actually filing with CFIUS and securing approval from CFIUS has become more complicated in recent years because of changes to the CFIUS statute. Uh, one change is actually designed to give parties to transactions greater flexibility in terms of how they file with CFIUS. So now parties can choose a shorter filing called a declaration with a shorter CFIUS review period than has traditionally been available. And one advantage of going down this route is uh, you can really cut down on your, your government review considerably. The declaration by statute must be reviewed within 30 calendar days which is far shorter than the up to 90 day review period done under the normal CFIUS filing process. Now the downside to the short form is that a response to a short form can take one of several uh, actions. CFIUS can take one of several actions. The best of course is that CFIUS approves the transaction. No national security concerns go forward. Uh, second though, CFIUS can decide that it can't express an opinion based on a short form. It doesn't have enough information, uh, some practitioners call this the shoulder shrug by CFIUS, the no opinion letter, the punt, the limbo letter. This can be unhelpful. Some people like them, some people don't like them. And then third, and the worst result, is that if you file a short form, CFIUS can decide that you're going to actually be required to do the long form after all, which adds weeks uh, and cost to the process. Uh, now, it's important for parties to have a meeting of the minds of what they will cons consider to be approval by CFIUS, because some parties will find these no opinion letters to be perfectly acceptable. It gives them the comfort they need that the government has had the chance to look at a transaction and has not decided to raise a red flag. Other parties and other regulators uh, take a more conservative approach to that question. They want actual CFIUS approval. Third point, final point, is not to forget about the new mandatory filing requirements for some transactions. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into them de in detail, but if a US business is involved in critical technology, critical infrastructure, or holds large amounts of US citizen personal data, filing with CFIUS can be mandatory in some circumstances. And the CFIUS regulations spend a lot of ink on each of these categories explaining uh, what, what is included and not included in each category. So just on the issue of critical infrastructure, which is of relevance to a number of you, CFIUS has a long and somewhat, I would say, convoluted matrix that defines businesses that it considers to be critical infrastructure. And depending on the specifics, telecommunications networks, rail lines, oil pipelines and refineries, uh, bulk power storage facilities, and others could be considered critical infrastructure. So it's important to review the details uh, in figuring out whether a filing is actually mandatory with CFIUS. Uh, and I'll stop there, Peter.
Okay, thank you, uh, Damon and Brian. We're now going to throw it open to the panel here. Um, uh, Damon, I think you're going to start by chatting with Greg. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so, Greg, thanks again for for, for joining us today. Um, maybe as, as, a, as a starting point, if you could just give a little more background, maybe click down a bit on on your experience uh, with transactions at Entergy. And then we can dive into uh, some of uh, some additional questions around how you face that myriad of regulatory review and agencies that Brian and I walked through. Sure, sure. Uh, Entergy is a vertically integrated electric utility. We've got operations primarily in Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, and Mississippi, some plants in the Northeast. We own electric transmission and distribution systems in, in the southern states as well as generating facilities. We use those facilities to serve retail customers in those states. In those states, the retail uh, market has not been deregulated, so there isn't retail competition. Um, we serve as a traditional vertically integrated utility for those states. Although at wholesale, FERC has implemented wholesale competition, and so our, our plants function in the wholesale market as well. Our experience with asset acquisitions mostly resolve, revolves around asset acquisitions, which are subject to state, federal uh, regulation, both by FERC and DOJ, although not a regulatory agency, they're more of an enforcement agency. Uh, also has, we also have some filing requirements there as well. Our experience with, um, with these transactions largely revolves around the uh, purchase of generating assets. During the early 1990s, there was a huge build out of independent uh, power producers, uh, plants that uh, were built in the Southeast and in fact across the country uh, based on the expectation that retail competition would come through. After the California energy crisis and the Enron scandal, um, that retail competition didn't materialize in a lot of states, particularly the states where Entergy is at. A number of those generators, because of the market conditions, the overbuild, oversupply, and credit crunch, um, ultimately became distressed assets. They started going bankrupt in the early 2000s. Entergy and other utilities in the Southeast stepped in and started to purchase these assets. Uh, and so from roughly about 2005 to 2017, we purchased around you know, roughly nine or 10 uh, generating assets. That's where our experience comes from. Great. And, um, you know, in, in, in reviewing mergers, I, I touched on this a bit um, in my overview, FERC applies a public interest standard under Section 203 of the Federal Power Act, whereas the DOJ applies the substantially lessens competition standard under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. And obviously, then the state public utilities have their own public interest standards. So given all these, these standards, how uh, do these regulatory kind of differences and landscape <clears throat> affect energies kind of assessment of transactions, willingness to engage in transactions? How do you approach that? Sure, and I, I think the best way to think of it is to think of the states and DOJ mm -hmm. as two bookends with FERC kind of in between. Um, and I say that because if you look at the state public utility commissions, they focus on the public interest standard, but they're really focused on the public interest from the perspective of retail customers in that state. And so really what we need to do when we uh, propose a transaction to make an asset acquisition, we have to justify to the state that this is a prudent transaction, that it's economic, that it'll have benefits for customers. And that's really the focus of the inquiry. Um, at, at DOJ and the other, other end of the bookend, so to speak, at DOJ, the focus is really on competition and how, um, even though there isn't competition in retail markets, how will the purchase of this generating asset potentially impact wholesale competition, uh, sales between uh, producers that don't ultimately use the energy but sell it to other end users. Um, FERC falls somewhere in between. FERC has jurisdiction over wholesale markets, not retail markets. So. It, it does look at the impact of retail customers, regulation, affiliate issues, like a typical regulator. Um, but it, but because the wholesale market does have competitive aspects to it, uh, FERC also looks at competition. And there is where uh, FERC and the DOJ uh, 
process and competitive analyses tend to overlap, although in practice they end up being very different. What this means for us is how we assess risk for these transactions is, is really the state review is, is kind of a threshold question. We have to be able to justify uh, an asset acquisition as being prudent and basically a good business decision at the state level before we can move forward. Uh, once we're able to do that, our job then becomes to go to FERC at, and DOJ and explain why the asset acquisition has no impact on competition. Our objective there is to, to get uh, approval from FERC, uh, to get DOJ to allow it to clear HSR review. DOJ doesn't really approve the transactions per se. Um, but what we want to do that is under terms and conditions that, that don't undermine the benefits at retail. Um, and so uh, these uh, both DOJ and FERC can impose uh, if they if they see anti-competitive effects of a transaction, they can impose mitigation of remedies, and those remedies, depending on how they're structured, can undermine the benefits of the transaction, the basic rationale for the transaction at state level. So really, we view the state process as a gating process to justify the transaction, and then as we move through the federal review process, we're trying to uh, to get through that process and address any competition issues that arise without undermining the, the fundamental economics of the deal. It, it makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Greg. I guess thinking about um, the, 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 re the review processes, right? So setting aside kind yeah. of the substantive differences, um, the review processes at, at FERC and at, and at DOJ, can you talk a little bit about how they differ, in particular around filing requirements under the 203 application, the HSR filing, and then in turn, how you interact with staff during those during those reviews. Sure, uh, I think you know understanding those the differences really uh, for me at least it, it helps to think about the differences between the agencies themselves and their roles because most of the procedural and substantive differences flow from those differences, and and FERC is a regulatory agency that has an obligation under the Federal Power Act to review all asset acquisitions, mergers within its jurisdiction. Uh, and so the process it develops, both from a substantive test perspective and a procedural perspective, it has to allow FERC to be able to review transactions within a six month time period. That's generally the time period that's allotted. There are exceptions to that. Um, but uh, it has to be able to review all of the transactions and it has to be able to ensure they meet certain criteria. And so FERC has to develop a test that is easy for it to apply to all transactions. Uh, in contrast to that, DOJ is really an enforcement agency, as you and Doug have told me on many occasions. They're not a regulator. They don't have to approve transactions. They basically uh, review transactions to determine whether there's a potential violation, civil or criminal, of the antitrust laws. And if there is, they can go to a state to try and have that transaction enjoined, or they can condition it subject to a settlement agreement with the parties. Um, so really DOJ is not subject to the same types of limitations at FERC. And so DOJ's process is really set up more for an intensive transaction specific review of a transaction. All of the specific ins and outs of, of a particular generating unit, for example, where that generating unit is located, how it could impact the market, how whether we have an incentive or an ability to withhold that generating particular generating unit. Whereas FERC's kind of more generic test looks at market power more indirectly, looks at the structure of the market, has you follow through a formulaic modeling process that all utilities follow that is standardized across transactions. Um, and so that really impacts uh, how both you interact with staff and what the process is at FERC. It's a formal process uh, that is subject to certain due process requirements. You can have a pre-filing meeting with FERC staff ahead of time, but once you file, that, agree uh, that, that filing then becomes subject to FERC's ex parte rules, which means uh, the decision makers can have conversations off the record with specific parties. All, con all discussions of the issues have to occur on the record. So, uh, so with FERC staff in a particular transaction, once you make the filing and after that pre-filing meeting, um, 
those conversations stop. Uh, and then parties file interventions, you file responses, and hopefully at some point you get an order. Um, in contrast, at, at DOJ, it's, it's much more of an informal process where you're basically talking to DOJ staff and convincing them they shouldn't initiate a formal process before a district court to enjoin a transaction. And so the interaction is, is really the entire process at DOJ, informal meetings with DOJ staff, meetings with their economists, their attorneys, it is really the entire process, unlike the, unlike the FERC uh, process. And that continues after the filing, yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. And and I, I think we're, we're going to be able to circle back with, with additional questions. I appreciate your input here. I'm, I'm going to uh, kick it over to, to Fred uh, now from, from Brookfield. Um, Fred, can you start just by introducing uh, folks to, to Brookfield and uh, talking generally about your experience uh, with transactions and regulated industries? I know we worked together on a, a railroad transaction recently, but I think you guys work in a number of different regulated industries. Sure. Uh, thanks, Peter. So, yes, I'm at Brookfoot Asset Management. I focus or I work in the um, infrastructure group. So, you know, we, we're always going to have some type of regulatory requirement. Obviously, another thing I say is, you know, Brookfoot is obviously a Canadian-based um, company. So, um, all of our transactions, you know, we're going to have to deal with CFIUS. So, um, you know, as I said, we're in the infrastructure. So, I never go into a transaction expecting to not have some type of regulatory um, um, you know, filing. Um, you know, given my 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 background is primarily M and A and capital markets. Um, I I every time I go through a transaction, it's always a new learning experience. Um, and so, for example, as you mentioned, Peter, um, we worked on um, the G and W um, acquisition, which involved the STB, and I didn't even know what the STB stood for until. <laughs> um that transaction and you know after that transaction uh I, I was thoroughly um aware of you know the ins and outs of the stb um but you know i, I think um like as i said you know depending on the, the nature of the asset um we're gonna have to deal with FERC, um you know local uh, regulatory requirements um permits and things of that nature um you know but we obviously um would prefer in every transaction to ensure that there is no regulatory filing or it's a very smooth process, but I think the key thing is we're focusing on it from the standpoint of ensuring that when we when we bid on an asset, um, you know, Brookfoot is not, um, you know, uh, adversely impacted um, in the bidding process relative to other bidders. So if you take the STB, for example, um, we recognize that every every potential bidder is going to need an STB approval of some sort. So that's that's fine. Um, you know, when you think about um, you know your your customary uh, antitrust filings. We typically don't we don't have too many um, competing. You know we don't have assets in every single um, um, industry in the U.S. So we haven't really ran across scenarios where you know there's a true antitrust issue. And more importantly, when you're dealing with a sponsor or a private equity fund, um, um, the antitrust um, uh, agencies typically only look at um, specific funds. And so we typically try to make sure that um, you know, if, if we have one LNG facility in, in, in fund three, we're not going to have another one in fund four, um, right. and things like that. But, um, but again, we, we really try to focus on ensuring that when we're bidding, um, you know, we're not, um, uh, at a disadvantage because of some unique issue, um, that, that Brookfoot has. And, you know, sometimes we have dealt with that, particularly in the jurisdictions where we have to, you know, um, consider divesting an asset. Think, you know, how, do we, how do we deal with a particular antitrust issue? But um, you know, fortunately for us in the U.S., we haven't we haven't had to deal with that. Yeah. So, so you mentioned <laughs> other jurisdictions. I, I was hoping you might be able to talk briefly about how your experience in the U.S. might be similar to or differ from um, other uh, foreign jurisdictions. Is it easier in the U.S.? Harder? What's your perspective? Uh, it's, it's definitely easier. What I would say is. Um, in the U.S., for the most part, you have very objective standards. Um, you, you have um, case law, which gives you a good sense of of um, how the courts or how the agency is going to decide. Like, for example, um, if we're going to buy utility in the U.S., we pretty much know that um, you know the 10, 20 percent rule is a change of control. So, therefore, we know what that looks like. So, if we're going to buy more than 20 percent, 
there's no gray area in terms of whether or not we actually need approval. Um, the last thing I'd say is, for the most part, again, in the U.S., there's very um, strict, or you know, there's an attempt to have a have a have a, um, a timeline. So we know it's going to take, you know, four months, you know, six months, or or to a year. Um, and so, you know, obviously, there's a, there's some headaches around, and you know, how do we meet the standards to get the approval? But in other jurisdictions, there's typically no timeline, so you don't know when you're going to get it. Um, there's typically um, no case law, and it's very sub it's, it's it's very subjective from the standpoint of depending on um, who's in power at the time, they that may determine who's going to if you're going to get the approval or not, which then becomes very political. Where in the U.S., it's obviously there's at least some on its face is 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 um, we're trying to not be political. Um, you know, I think the other the other thing is I mentioned subjectivity. You know, we've seen other jurisdictions where just being a foreign investor you are inherently disadvantaged from the standpoint of we're not going to give you the approval and if we do we're going to make you you know earn it or give some type of concessions and so i i think in the us um it's much more um straightforward there's case law there's a timeline you know certain certain jurisdictions or state jurisdictions i would say are almost as bad if not worse than some foreign jurisdictions uh, <laughs> um, you know there's like you know the permitting processes in california for example are, are you know very challenging to have a true sense of of um, you know how it's going to come out and if you're if you're going through a permitting process you know understanding how much and how long it's going to take you know which impacts you know our, our returns um sometimes can be very 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 frustrating but i think for the most part um you know being being in the u.s you know buying um assets in the u.s you pretty much know the process that you're going to go through. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Fred. So you, you mentioned Brookfield's Canadian residency. Um, can, can you talk about how you've interacted with CFIUS, your experiences thus far, um, positive, negative, uh, and how you kind of approach that on each transaction? Sure. So as I said, Can um, Brookfield is a Canadian-based company. So by definition, we're foreign. And um, you know, as, as, as Brian mentioned, there, are, there have been some new rules. and you know, even so, so most sponsors, even if they have foreign investors, if they're U.S. based, they still fall into a specific, you know, kind of friendly category. Well, because Brookfield is foreign and we also have, you know, foreign sponsors, you know, we're still subject to the customary um, CFIUS approval process. And that being said, um, you know, we we are very focused on ensuring that we have a very positive relationship with, with CFIUS. Um, and which is why we we never have any concerns about obtaining CFUS approval. Um, and again, going back to the to the to the to when we talk to sellers, you can imagine that if we're bidding on a on an asset and we're one of five, and the other bidders are U.S. based, when they see our bid and they see that it requires some type of CFUS approval, depending on the sophistication of the of the seller, they that's a non-starter, right? So so. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is, you know, educate them on what CFIUS is, tell them that we have, you know, a, a very long history of getting CFIUS approval. We, you know, Brooklyn has never gotten denied, never had to have any mitigation, things like that. Um, you know, we have a dedicated team that is very focused on ensuring that, you know, we do our CFIUS diligence, ensure that the issues are, we, we know exactly what we're dealing with. And um, usually we get, we get, uh, we get them comfortable. The last thing I'd say is even when for timing reasons or um, the seller just can't get their head wrapped around CFIUS, we always still make a filing and, and not have it as a closing condition because um, we would obviously prefer to have a closing condition, particularly if there's a very material CFIUS issue that we don't want to inherit. Um, but, um, you know, so that's obviously a kind of our, our first, you know, our first uh, position. But if there's some like very unique timing dynamic where you know it's going to require a 90-day approval process and it's in November and they want to close by the end of the year, um, we always just make the filing because that maintains our relationship with CFIUS. And so you know that's something that we always do um, to ensure that um, we maintain that relationship. So therefore, there's never going to be any issues down the road, and we can continue to tell sellers that you know it should not be an issue um, um, in, in this particular transaction. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That's, that's really helpful background. 
Well, I, I think we'll um, turn to Hadas now. Um, Hadas, can you just give us a, a brief introduction of, of DISH and, uh, and your experiences with, with uh, transactions? Um, absolutely. Uh, so you guys may all know DISH as a satellite TV provider, um, but we're actually a connectivity company. So in addition to providing satellite TV, we launched the first live streaming over the top video service Sling TV in 2015. Um, in July of this year, we became a nationwide wireless carrier through our acquisition of Boost Mobile. And we continue to innovate in wireless, uh, building the nation's first cloud-native open RAN 5G broadband network. Um, I think I can bring a, a little bit of um, a different perspective uh, in my experience to the panel in that uh, much of my experience at DISH um, over the last almost decade uh, has been with uh, respect to third-party advocacy uh, mm -hmm. in ongoing mergers. So um, as you guys might know, the, the telecom industry, at least over the past almost decade that I've been at DISH, has seen a lot of consolidation from programmers consolidating, wireless providers and cable companies merging, and sort of any combination <laughs> in between uh, cable companies buying uh, programmers or uh, wireless companies buying pay TV providers. Um, and so we've participated in a number of those, um, uh, the review process for a number of those uh, mergers over the past several years um, at the FCC and the DOJ. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can, can you talk a bit about your experience in the in the T-Mobile Sprint um, transaction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that was a merger, um, gosh, announced in, I, I think, April 2018. Uh, and that was a merger that uh, faced review both at the FCC and the Department of Justice. Uh, and DISH, uh, you know, advocated uh, at both agencies against the structure of the deal as it was proposed. We mm -hmm. uh, put in findings about the impact to consumers and competition of the consolidation of the wireless market from four to three players. And we proposed sort of um, a remedy of, you know, the facilitation of a the entry of a fourth facilities-based carrier. Um, and throughout the course of uh, almost the two-year review process, um, DISH was essential to the remedy ultimately imposed by the Department of Justice. Um, and that's actually, you know, part and parcel of our acquisition of Boost in July of this year. Um, and there are a number of other elements of the remedy uh, imposed by the Department of Justice um, with elements approved by the FCC that became sort of critical to the approval of that transaction, which was also challenged by a number of states' attorneys general, um, uh, and there was a trial in the Southern District of New York. Yeah, extremely, you know, a lot of moving parts, obviously, in that transaction. Yeah. I, I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about how the FCC and DOJ interacted and, and how you interacted with each agency, you know, just in terms of nuts and bolts on how this played out. Yeah, sure. I, I can talk just sort of generally about the differences in advocating in front of the two agencies. Sure, um, yeah. Uh, just sort of at a, at a high level, um, and I think Greg mentioned this with respect to FERC, um, but the FCC has a, a public process for its, you know, transaction review. Um, and so what that means is that the applicants have to file um, their, you know, merger application publicly with the agency. The agency then creates a, you know, pleading cycle where, you know, third parties and interested parties can comment on um, the applications and, and sort of everything is done in public view. There's a docket that's publicly accessible. Of course, there's always um, confidentiality provisions, uh, you know, for competitively sensitive information, but in general, it's a, it's a pretty public process. And so um, in that way, uh, um, you can sort of see as a, you know, observer or anyone monitoring the docket, the big issues that are being discussed or hashed out amongst the parties, um, including, you know, the FCC and the applicants, uh, because those are all going to be disclosed in filings or any time um, a party meets with the FCC, uh, they have to disclose a summary of that meeting um, at the agency in an ex parte. And so um, it's there's a lot of sort of 
ability as just an observer or another third party that's um, involved in the proceeding to sort of understand the state of play and what's going on. Um, and for example, you can you can sort of start seeing by the types of filings fl flying back and forth, you know, what the agency might be drilling down on or what the mm -hmm. arguments are um, on all sides, what third parties are saying, what the applicants are responding, um, things like that. And you can also get a sense of sort of the timeline of the transaction review. Um, because you can you can see sort of you know our parties right now discussing the harms our parties right now discussing potential conditions or remedies and that can give you a sense of how far along the agency is in its review. Um, the FCC also has a transaction review clock on its website. They have a 180 day transaction review timeline. Um, it's it's aspirational, but it's still a good indicator of sort of how far along we are in the life of the transaction review. And the FCC updates that on its website. Um, sometimes it pauses the shot clock, reinstates it, depending on what's going on in the proceeding. Um, in contrast, uh, the DOJ process is not public. Uh, so if you're sort of a, a third party or, um, you know, an interested party uh, and, mm -hmm. and you're not, you know, regularly meeting with the agency or even if you are, uh, it, there's a lot less um, ability to read the tea leaves of what's going on because it doesn't have the same kind of public docket that the FCC does. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Hadass. Thank you. And, and in terms of the substantive standards between the two, I mean, I understand that the FCC applies this just general public interest standard. Yeah. And the, the DOJ applies the, the substantially lessens competition standard. Have you had to deal with the interplay between those two standards and how you advocate for one or the other before the two different uh, agencies? Um, I think there, I mean, the, the FCC standard is the public interest convenience and necessity. Um, right. And so, you know, I think that the, the competitive effects are an important um, element of the public interest standard, a, a lessening of competition. Um, are usually impact the public interest in that consumers, um, you know, may have less choices, may face higher prices, may uh, experience the downstream effects that come from a lessening of competition. Right, right, makes sense. Okay, well, I think we are uh, bumping up against our time. Um, I appreciate everyone's uh, participation in the panel today. Uh, your time and insights are very much appreciated. Uh, to our attendees, uh, we hope you found the program informative. Um, if you had a question that you were unable to ask, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to it, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, uh, to Brian or Damon directly, and we can uh, route it as appropriate. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we're going to share a recording uh, to the full program in the coming days. Um, and finally, if you haven't registered for the next uh, and final webinar in our symposium series, uh, it's on October 22. It's about uh, the impact of uh, the upcoming elections, very timely. Uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, information is here on the screen, uh, and you can register on our website. Uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.